Oh, yeah, I'm free today, man. You know what I'm saying? So, today and tomorrow, I'll expect some videos. Now, I know I have been haven't been the most active. I've had some changes to my schedule as far as my personal life. But on the weekends, I will uh, be more active. And um, I guess by the picture, you already can see who my number five pick is. Uh, at one point in time, I had uh, the number, I had Bird at number four. But I had to put him down a little bit for reasons I will explain in the next video. But at number five, I have Larry Joe Bird. And I know I can already see what's coming with this one. Um, look, I don't mind people asking, saying something like this, but I'm just going to put it out there right now. Why do I have Bird ahead of Kobe Bryant? Kobe Bryant, you can make the argument, had the better overall career. Okay? I, I understand that. Um, he had a longer career. He won more championships than Larry Bird. But the reason why I, I, I cannot put Kobe Bryant ahead of Larry Bird is for a couple of reasons. Um, if you're talking about the numbers, right? Kobe Bryant averaged 25 points, uh, about five rebounds, and about five assists for his career, which are phenomenal numbers. He shot four, a little bit under 45% for his career, which isn't extraordinary, but it's, it's decent. Uh, shot 33% from three-point range and 84% from the free throw line, so he was a great shooter. Larry Bird, on a team that was stacked, on a team that had Robert Parrish, a Hall of Famer, Kevin McHale, a Hall of Famer, although I don't think either one of those players are top 50, but they're definitely top, you know, uh, 65 to Parrish maybe being a top 80 or something like that, or, or, give or take. Well, for a front line that stacked, plus also earlier in his career playing with Nate Archibald, although he was a, not the Nate Archibald, but the Kansas City Omaha Kings by that time, but he still was a great player. But having played with all these guys and, and, and Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge, right? Bird was still able to average for his career 24.3 points, 10 rebounds, and 6.3 assists per game. <clears throat> and Bird only took about 17 shots, I think, a game for his career. Didn't get to the foul line a lot because he was more or less a jump shooter. Um, but he shot nearly 89% from the foul line for his career. Shot just a hair under 50% for his career despite being primarily a jump shooter, though he could get down low and, and score uh, in the, in the uh, post, but more in the high post than the low post. Um, and he was a 38% career three-point shooter. Though, I think his overall percentage would be a little bit higher. 38% is still great. I think it was 37.6% for his career. But I think it would be a little bit higher if he didn't eschew, or meaning he didn't refrain from taking that shot from about 80 to 85. His rookie year, he took a lot of three-point attempts for the era. If you look at the numbers, he took a lot of them that year. But then he kind of refrained from taking them uh, until about 85, 86. 85, I think. That's when he started taking them again. It started actually becoming one of the first guys, well, at least one of the first noble players, to use that shot as a weapon along with uh, Dr. Duncan Stein, uh, Daryl Griffith, who also utilized that shot. And for a while, I had the record for most three-pointers in the season. I think it was 91 and then 92 or something broke his own record. Uh, but Bird didn't take that shot for a couple of years and only took it with like the shot clock running down or had to force up a bad three-pointer or something like that. So that's why his percentage for a couple of years was kind of low. Um, and in some of the playoffs, that was the, the, the thing about his percentage. Um, but if you take away that, and when he actually was consciously trying to shoot that shot, he's more of a 40% three-point shooter. I know, uh, I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but if you know the era, and the reason why I mention that is because they didn't take as many three-point attempts, um, it's a smaller sample size, so you have to look at the years when they were taking more of them and kind of take out those years when they weren't really shooting them a lot and it was more like shot clock violation or shot clock running down or forcing up a bad shot, you know, 
So that's why I kind of say the numbers don't tell the whole story. Sometimes you got to look at the games and look at the situations. But basically what I'm trying to say is Bird for his career was a 50-40-90 guy, basically. Um, and if he wanted to, he could be a guy who could let the NBA scoring. In fact, in 1987 88 season, which is probably the last year we really saw Bird in his prime, he averaged just a hair under 30 points per game that year. And I, th- I want to say he was third in the league in scoring behind Jordan and maybe Wilkins. I don't know if Carmelo was up there yet. But anyway, said all of that. Bird came into the NBA in 1979 and instantly, instantly made the Boston Celtics a contending team. They were instant contenders. All right. Uh, before that, you know, John Havlicek had retired uh, in 1970, after the 77-78 season. And basically the Boston Celtics were uh, just a, a terrible team. You know what I'm saying? All of the great players had either been traded away or retired, and um, they were a terrible team. I think they won like 29 games or something like that. Bird comes on the team, and remember, this is before they acquired uh, Robert Parrish via trade with the Golden State Warriors, and this is before they acquired Kevin McHale. They won 61 games. It was a 32-game turnaround at the time. It was the greatest turnaround in NBA history. And Bird went on to win Rookie of the Year. All right. One of the greatest rookie campaigns in the history of the NBA. All right. And uh, young Larry Bird was a feisty Larry Bird. You know, I think some of the younger players, because of the HD quality, you know, videos, you know, I understand that's really important. And I like HD quality, too. You know what I'm saying? I've gotten kind of into that, too. You know what I'm saying? I didn't realize when I was watching basketball in the 80s and 90s, I was watching bad quality basketball. I'm going to tell you somehow how bad the quality was when I was a kid, like when a when kid going into teenage years, right? I used to watch the Chicago Bulls play like in the uh, mid to late 90s, right? And if they had like a, a far off shot, <clears throat> remember that year in the NBA on NBC? I want to say it was like 97 or something like that. You guys might remember this. When they used to show like the overhead shot a lot, right? Like, like, if you're, like, on a rap, like, if you were hanging from the rafters and looking down the court, they would show, like, this overhead shot. And sometimes I couldn't tell the difference between Ron Harper and Michael Jordan. The only way I could tell the difference is, uh, I'm talking about from the television I had. The only way I could tell the difference is, if I look at Ron Harper, he had a tendency to drag his feet when he's playing defense. He used to kind of drag his feet. And I said, I squint, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's Harper. That's Harper. That's how bad... The quality of my television sometimes was. Uh, I finally got a more high resolution set, like around 90, I think it was sometime in late 97. But anyway, I understand you want to look at the higher resolution videos, and this tends to be buried in the 90s when he was falling off physically and skill wise. But in the 80s, especially the early to mid 80s, is Larry Bird is absolute best. You know what I'm saying? He was. Physical, he would, you know, uh, he played a style very suited for the Eastern Conference and for the Boston uh, Eastern Conference and the Boston culture. He was, it was gritty. You might have heard guys like Dominique Wilkins and Isaiah Thomas and those guys talk about how the Eastern Conference basketball style of play was different from the Western Conference. The Western Conference was more free flowing and you know, um, less physical. That's why you had all these high-scoring games out there with the Warriors and the Nuggets and even the Lakers, although they could get down and dirty themselves. Eastern Conference was gritty, and Bird embodied that. And that's why earlier in his career, Bird was a tremendous rebounder for a guy who only had an average vertical leap of about 28 inches. You know, that's when Bird was averaging like 21 points, 11, 12 rebounds per game, dishing out seven assists. You know what I'm saying? He could do it all on the court. Now, many people mention that Bird wasn't the greatest one-on-one defensive player. He wasn't. He was a little bit slow for it. Uh, although he gave effort on defense, he just wasn't a great defensive player. But I wouldn't say he was terrible either uh, before the back injuries. He wasn't terrible. He was good. Uh, well, he was decent. 
uh, one-on-one, but he wasn't great. But what he excelled in was help defense and, 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 and overall um, team defense. He excelled. He was phenomenal as a help defender. And um, his basketball IQ was – you remember me saying this about Bill Russell. Larry Bird is at that same stratosphere as far as basketball IQ. And that's another thing you're going to notice about my top ten. Most of these guys have exceptional – I think all of them have exceptional, exceptionally high basketball IQs, something that holds certain players back. Like, I mean, i got to be honest with you, Russell Westbrook, sometimes on the basketball court, not a high basketball IQ guy. You know, and I have to accept that recently. But um, <clears throat> Larry Bird wanted to win a championship in 1981 and brought back a winning culture with the Boston Celtics that had been missing for a couple of years. Um, in 1983, I think it was, the Celtics were swept by the Milwaukee Bucks in the semis, I think it was. And uh, the reason why I mention that is because many people forget how good that Milwaukee Bucks team was in the 1980s. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The Milwaukee Bucks is the best team in the 1980s not to make an NBA Finals. And they were a great team. For pretty much throughout the entire 1980s, all the way up until like 1988 or so, they started falling off. Uh, Larry Bird got revenge of sorts against Magic Johnson. And I say revenge because in 1979, in the NCAA championship game, Bird's Indiana State team lost to uh, Magic Johnson's Michigan team for the title. And uh, this was... Revenge of sorts, and Bird's team won the championship in seven games. All right, Boston went back to the finals in revenge in '85. Well, a rematch, I guess, from Bird's position in '85, but this time the Lakers were triumphant. But the 1986 season is the magical one for Celtic fans because Boston acquired Bill Walton. And Bird, McHale, Parrish never played better together. They had a great, awesome bench with Rick Carlisle. Yeah, that that Rick Carlisle, the coach of the Dallas Mavericks. You know, uh, what was his name? Um, Whitman. Can't remember his first name right now. Uh, Sam Vincent, I think, was on that team. Um, you know, they had a great overall squad. And um, they won 67 games, which is second all-time. In the franchise, I've, I've heard people erroneously say that was the franchise record, and it's not. The franchise record was set by the 1973 Boston Celtics, who won 68 ball games. Uh, but the reason why people don't remember that team, despite Dave Collins winning MVP and despite uh, Tom Heisman winning Coach of the Year that season, they lost in the conference finals to the eventual champion New York Knicks. Um, so that team just doesn't get remembered. That's why it's important to win a title when you have a historic team. Uh, that's why that 73 Warriors team isn't going to be remembered like the 72 Bulls team. As Ron Harper said, it doesn't mean a thing if you ain't got that ring. All right, so <clears throat> this is the thing. Around the time Larry Bird won his second title in 1986, one of the greatest teams ever, beating the Houston Rockets in six games. During the 86-87 season, Bird was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And it was around this time i say about 1987. Can you remember back then, people had more historical perspective. Bob Cousy, the great Celtic, played during the 1950s into the 1960s. Saw all the greats. Will Chamberlain, uh, Bill Russell, John Havlicek, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, Oscar Robertson, you name it. Will Chamberlain, if I haven't said them. I think I did say Will. Kareem. He said <clears throat> that he thought at that time that Larry Bird keeps this up. He's going to go down as the greatest player to ever flip, to play this foolish game. More or less, that was his quote. Unfortunately, Larry Bird's style of play, in combination with terrible genetics, uh, would derail the rest of his career. Now, the Celtics would go on to the finals that year in 87. And... Um, If things had broke a little bit differently, 
in that series, in game four, when they were down 2-1, if Magic Johnson doesn't hit that baby hook shot over the outstretched arms of Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale, if McHale hadn't hurt his leg, his foot, excuse me, and he was able to play a little bit better defense because he had a broken foot during the playoffs, if Magic misses that shot, if Bird Heroics uh, had paid off, they win that game, the series is even. Does that series play out differently? You know, Bird wins a fourth championship and it happens. But after that, injuries began to beset Larry Bird. And uh, he missed the entire, almost the entire 88-89 season with bone spurs. And although he came back, he was never the same player. And his back got worse and worse and worse. Um, it totally robbed him of any defensive prowess. Uh, it made him more of a stationary guy. He couldn't run up and down the court anymore, really. Not really. Um, and he couldn't practice like he wanted to. So a lot of his ball handling abilities, a lot of that stuff began to diminish. So Bird became more of a power power forward or less, although listed as small forward. And he's pretty much more of a playmaker now. Um, but he still played for a couple of years. He still wanted to play because of competition and, and the, the chance of being on a championship team. And in 1991, that team started off with the best record in the Eastern Conference. But injuries, particularly Larry Bird, derailed that team. And, of course, the, the uh, Chicago Bulls went on to have the best record in the Eastern Conference and uh, went on to win the championship of the year against the, the Los Angeles Lakers. So instead of Larry and Magic in a potential last matchup that year, it was Michael and Magic and the changing of the guard. Larry Bird played one more year, but by this time he was gone physically. And his back was killing him. Um... He had to have adjustments every game to be able to play basketball. He had to wear a back brace all the time. And uh, Larry Bird had one last ride that year when uh, he was selected to play at Barcelona, even though I know that deep down inside, he probably felt he wasn't worthy of being on that team, but he had earned his spot to be on that team. I think Magic Johnson had to talk him into doing it because Bird was pretty much done with basketball. Uh, but after that, soon after the Olympic run, that gold medal uh, winning run that that dream team had in Barcelona, Bird called it quits. I think, it was, I think the date was August 19th, 1992. I'll never forget it. When Larry Joe Bird retired from the Boston Celtics. And um, it was sad because you got to remember that much less than a year earlier, Magic Johnson had announced his retirement due to the HIV virus. So it was the end of an era. It truly was the end of an era. And uh, the reason why I have Larry Bird so high, man, is because if Larry Bird was able, <clears throat> in my opinion, to have the health and to keep his level of play as long as a Michael Jordan there will be a real discussion about GOAT with Bird. There will be a real discussion about whether or not he was the greatest player to ever play in this game. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm, not, I'm not even getting into the psychological warfare that he would uh, do to opponents. Um, people talk about Gary Payton. I think Gary Payton was more of a trash talker, like yank, 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 yank. Bird's trash talk was more strategic and more de and devastating to me. Um, he would just do things to psychologically. I mean, it wasn't just enough that the Celtics themselves, the mystique of the Celtics in the 80s, was enough to just beat teams psychologically in that way. But then Bird would just devastate his opponents. You know, I mean... He would get offended if a white guy was guarding him. You know what I'm saying? Like, Why you got this slow white dude guarding me? I'm going to kill you. Why you got this slow white boy guy? I'm going to kill you guys tonight. You know? 
Um, I'm going to hit a game with a shot right there. There ain't shit you going to do about it. And he would go out and do it and just walk up the court. He was a fucking killer, man. Walk into the, you know, the opponent's locker room and be like, okay, I just want to let y'all know that we went in this game tonight and I'm going to score 45 points. There ain't shit you going to do about it. And he'd go out and score 45 points. He would purposely take himself out the game with three minutes to go because he had 45 points. He would do shit like this when he was in his prime. This is why Michael Jordan always mentioned Magic Johnson and Larry Bird with such reverence when he's talking in his interviews about aspiring to be seen in the same light as these guys. Now, you got people nowadays that got the nerve to say that Larry Bird wasn't the, quote, transformative player. Larry Bird wasn't a top 10 player. Now, I understand people can have their opinions, but to me, Larry Bird is one of the greatest players in the history of the NBA. Now, uh, let me see. Go through his accolades for his career. Uh, Larry Bird, of course. Three-time NBA champion, 81, 84, and 86. Two-time NBA Finals MVP, 84 and 86. I think in 81, it was won by uh, Cedric Cornbread and Maxwell. Three times he was the NBA MVP. He won it three years in a row, 84, 85, and 86. 12-time um, NBA All-Star. He was the All-Star Game MVP in 1982. Nine-time All-NBA First Team. He was on the All-NBA Second Team in 1990. Three times NBA All Defensive Second Team. That's like I said, he wasn't a terrible defensive player in his, when he was healthy. NBA Rookie of the Year in 1980. He was on the All NBA Rookie Team in 1980. Three times NBA Three Point Shootout Champion, 86 to 88. Twice he was on the 50 40 90 club, meaning shooting 50% from the floor, 40% from the three point range, and 90% from the foul line. Um, he was the Associated Press Athlete of the Year in 1986. His number 33 was retired by the Boston Celtics. He's on the NBA's 50th anniversary all-time team. I'm not going to go through the college stuff because, like I said, it's not totally relevant to um, this conversation the NBA player. Uh, not even going to mention the coach stuff because it's not relevant to this video. Uh, but he scored 21,791 points. Like I said, 24.3 points per game, 10 rebounds, 6.3 assists per game. Um... And he was, uh, he's in the Basketball Hall of Fame as a player. And, uh, I, you know. And, um, I also want to say something, too. <clears throat> Bird played in the era and dominated in an era where the league was totally, I had a conversation with someone about this, and I disagree with them totally. They say that they think that the small forwards of today are better than the small forwards of the 80s. And I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, yeah, you have Kevin Durant out there, you know, and you have Kawhi Leonard, okay, and you have LeBron James, three of the greatest players of all time. I get that. All right, but after that, there's a total and noticeable drop-off. You got to understand, when Larry Bird was playing the game, it was the age of the small forwards. You had Larry Bird, okay, you had... Julius Irvin. I'm just naming small forwards. You had Marquise Johnson. You had uh, Kiki Vandeweghe. You had James Worthy. You had Adrian Dantley. You had Alex English. You had uh, Dominique Wilkins. Uh, sometimes George Gervin would play three, although he was more or less a shooting guard. You had Mike Mitchell. You had Larry Keenan. Matter of fact, let me uh, let me just go through a list right quick. Yeah, Lando Woolrich. Give me a second. <clears throat> Later on, of course, he had Scottie Pippen. He had Chris Mullin. Later on, you had Mark Aguirre, you had Jamal Wilkes, Detlef Shrimp. Like basically, what I'm trying to say is that was the the, the era of the small forward. You know, what I'm saying it's like every team had 
a great small forward or a very, very good small forward. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm missing some teams in my head right now, but Larry Bird's era was truly the era of the small forward. If I didn't say Bernard King, Bernard King, I think I said him. But the point of it is he had to go up against generally somebody that he had to guard and respect every night in his position. Sometimes Bird didn't guard the best small forward. Sometimes he didn't. Uh, but more or less, he had to go up and face a small forward who could, uh, was devastating to say the least. All right. So pretty much that's it, man. This is my video on Larry Joe Bird, man. And tell me what you guys